cover many topics. I remember the interest as being very vital indeed, and the dialogue was meaningful to both me and, I think, to the members of the audience. The recording of both the talk and the question and answer period, while audible, is not of suitable quality, and so I have re-recorded both from the original transcript. I have adhered faithfully to this transcript. This is the only talk for which such re-recording has been necessary. I am very much impressed with the number of people who have turned out to hear this talk on counseling. Yet in one sense, it increases a problem that I feel very deeply. When I'm just giving one talk to a group, it always seems to me that the problem of communication is a very difficult one. I don't really know where you are, or what your thinking is, or what problems you're interested in. And you don't know where I am in my thinking, or what experiences I've had which might be relevant to you. So I have the real feeling that perhaps in a meeting like this, there may be hundreds of unspoken questions coming toward me, and yet what I say might be shooting in a direction which would not really answer any of them. For instance, as I have thought about this talk tonight, I have wondered whether I should talk about my research in psychotherapy. I have been very busy with that in recent months, and it's something that I could discuss, and yet I doubt whether it would be of as much interest to you as a more practical talk on counseling and psychotherapy. But then when I think about making my subject that of counseling and its methods and procedures, then I'm reminded of previous experiences I've met along that line, the results of which have made me rather unhappy. When I've talked about counseling methods, it has seemed to me that people who listen to me feel that I'm telling them what they should do, and then they tend to react to it in one of three ways. Some people feel, well, I should be doing it the way he says. After all, he's supposed to be the expert, so I will counsel in that way. And then you get a real lack of genuineness in the counseling. You're trying to do something that's not in accord with your own feeling and thinking, and I can't feel happy about that. Then some other members of the group tend to feel, well, I should be doing counseling the way he describes, but I'm not. So they tend to feel a little bit guilty, or at least they tend to lose something of their own confidence in the way in which they're dealing. And certainly when they do lose confidence, they do less satisfactory counseling. So I can't feel very happy about that. Then a third reaction that some people have is that, well, I certainly wouldn't counsel that way, and their feeling is simply one of antagonism and opposition, and I must say I can't feel very happy about that. So, in thinking it over, I decided that I would simply try to speak of my own personal experiences in carrying on counseling and psychotherapy. I suppose the real topic of my talk tonight might be my personal experience as a counselor in client-centered therapy as of 1953. I won't say 1954 because I don't believe I know yet what my way of counseling will be in 1954. There's a very good reason for giving a date, because my thinking as to what constitutes effective psychotherapy keeps changing all the time. I don't suppose there would ever be two years running when I would describe it in quite the same way. The reason for making it simply my own personal experiences in carrying on counseling is that then you can listen to it as something going on within me, and if anything in it clicks with your experience, then you will, perhaps you'll find that useful in crystallizing some of your own thinking and feeling. If there's no response in you, nothing that speaks to you in your experience from what has gone on in my experience, then I'm sure that it won't be difficult for you to forget this whole meeting. I think that I'd like to begin with some remarks about the therapeutic relationship beginning, of course, with my experience of the therapeutic relationship from the counselor's side. As time has gone by, I believe I consider the client less and less as an object 
and more and more as a person. I find it rewarding to give up entirely any diagnostic thinking about the person who comes to me. I am not interested in seeing this person as a compulsive individual, a schizoid one, or a psychopathic individual, or, of all things, a, quote, normal person. I am interested in entering into a subjective relationship with him. Some of the theological students who work with us in our courses in therapy have introduced me to Martin Buber, the philosopher at the University of Jerusalem, and I find his description of what he calls the I-Thou relationship is the kind of relationship that I am seeking with the clients who come to me, not what he calls the I-It relationship. In other words, it's a relationship between two persons meeting at a deep and significant level, not between a person and a complex object. Now, what attitudes in myself do I find rewarding to myself when I enter this relationship? This is something, certainly, which I put in a different way every year, trying to capture the essence of what is there in experience when one has the feeling that therapy is really going on. As of today, I like to think of it in terms of permitting or providing safety and freedom. Both of these terms have come to have a good deal of meaning to me. I want this person to be safe from any evaluation, moral or diagnostic. I sincerely want to make this relationship so safe that the client can relax, that he can let down his defenses, can begin to communicate with me, but what's much more important, can begin to communicate with himself. I should like to be so sensitive to his total reaction that I can go with him that I can accompany him into every nook and cranny of his experience as an understanding companion who makes it genuinely safe to explore in regions that he has previously felt might be very, very dangerous. Then in my attitude I want to permit him to have freedom. As time has gone on, I have come to realize that the freedom I wish to provide him is simply the most complete freedom imaginable. In his relationship with me, I would want him to be completely free to fear, to hate, to love, to despair. I want him to be free to experience any feeling toward himself, toward others, or toward me. I want him to be free to think and be and choose whatever he wishes, I have learned that only to the degree that I can grant myself the same kind of freedom of feeling can I really grant it to him. I think that's one reason why I like the statement of Dr. Warkentin of Atlanta that there is no therapist but a growing therapist. That is, it's practically impossible for a person who has reached some static position really to carry on psychotherapy. In this relationship, as it exists at any given moment, my major aim is to understand. If I can understand what it feels like to be him at this moment, if I can understand what he's trying to communicate, and even what he would like to communicate without knowing it, and if I can convey to him something of the understanding that I feel, then I think therapy will occur. My verbal part of the contact will be largely concerned with this kind of understanding and with conveying to him the fact that I do tentatively understand something of the difficulties and dangers that he's facing as he explores. Some time ago, I was in Mexico. It gave me a chance, the first chance in a long time, to really get away, get some perspective on what I was doing, 
and even to think a little without telephones, committees, and all that kind of thing. One morning, in the bright sunshine, I sat down to try to put down the essence of therapy as I have experienced it with a good many clients. And what I wrote that morning overlaps with what I've just said, but I'm going to read the portion of it that pertains to the relationship. I think that before I read it, I would say that certainly what I'm talking about tonight is the subjective side of psychotherapy. From everything I say this evening, you might think I have never heard the word research or done anything objective. Actually, we've carried on quite a few objective studies in therapy. I have a feeling that that's why it makes us free enough to consider also the very subjective side. At any rate, certainly tonight I'm talking about the subjective side. Now this is what I wrote about the relationship in therapy, trying to simply jot it down for myself. I launch myself into the relationship having a hypothesis or a faith that my liking, my confidence, my understanding of the other person's inner world will lead to a significant process of becoming. I enter the relationship not as a scientist, not as a physician who can accurately diagnose and cure, but as a person, and into a personal relationship. Insofar as I see him only as an object, the client will tend to become only an object. I risk myself because if, as the relationship deepens, what develops is a failure, a regression, or a repudiation of me and the relationship by the client, then I sense that I will lose myself, or a part of myself. At times this risk is very real, and is very keenly experienced. I let myself go into the immediacy of the relationship, where it is my total organism that takes over and is sensitive to the relationship, not simply my consciousness. I'm not consciously responding in a planful or analytic way, but simply reacting in an unreflecting way to another individual. My reaction being based, but not consciously, on my total organismic sensitivity to the I try to live the relationship on this basis. The essence of some of the deepest parts of therapy seems to be a unity of experiencing. The client is freely able to experience his feeling in its complete intensity as a pure culture, without intellectual inhibitions or cautions, without having it bounded contradictory feeling. I am able, with equal freedom, to experience my understanding of this feeling, without any conscious thought about it, without any apprehension or concern about where this will lead, without any type of diagnostic or analytical thinking, without any cognitive or emotional barriers to a complete letting go in understanding. This complete unity, wholeness of experiencing in the relationship, then it acquires the out-of-this-world kind of quality which many therapists have remarked upon. A sort of trance-like feeling in the relationship from which the client and I emerge at the end of the hour as if from a deep well or tunnel. In these moments there is, to borrow Buber's phrase, I thou relationship. A timeless living in the experience which is between the client and me. It is at the opposite pole from seeing the client or myself as an object. It is the height of personal subjectivity. I'm often aware of the fact that I do not know where this immediate relationship is leading. So both I and the client, often fearfully, 
let ourselves slip into the stream of becoming, a stream or a process which carries us along. It is the fact that the therapist has let himself float in this stream of experience or life previously and found it rewarding that makes him each time less taking the plunge. It's my confidence for the client to embark also a little bit at a time. It often seems as though this stream of experiencing leads to some goal. Probably the truer statement, however, is that its rewarding character lies within the process itself and that its major reward is both the client and me later, independently, in the process of becoming. Well, that concludes the quotation, and since thus far I've been very general, very subjective, not at all specific, let me read one or two excerpts from experiences with one client which seem to indicate that this relationship was degree achieved. I should like to illustrate something of the feeling of relationship if I can. Here's a brief excerpt from a seventh interview with a married woman of about 40 with marital difficulties, difficulties with her daughter, and a number of other problems. This is from the recorded interviews, and actually I'm going to take several of throughout this talk from this same case. I thought it might give more. She's puzzling very much over the fact that in these interviews she doesn't tend to talk about her problems. Instead, she goes off into very vague aspects of experiencing and she really can't understand why. She says, When I tell myself now that the climate here is act in a certain way, a certain part of me says, nuts, it isn't. I want to act. And yet this is how it's coming out. And then, I mean, I'm utterly confused. Is it something that's just happening? Or is it something that I want to happen this way? Well, I guess that answers itself, actually. If it's something that's just happening, then it's happening because I want it to happen. I think, possibly, that gives a little freedom and also the puzzlement in finding the experience of going her own way without even knowing what is her own way. I think another illustration from the 30th interview with this same client is interesting, where she comes in to relate the fact that she's had experience within herself since the last interview. She says, well, a very remarkable discovery. And then she laughs. And she says, I know it's, well, I found out that you actually care how this thing goes. She says, it gave me the feeling, sort of, well, maybe I'll let you get in the act, sort of. Now again, you see, on an examination sheet, I would have had the correct answer but it dawned on me that in the client-counselor kind of thing, you actually care what happens. And it was a revelation. No, no, not that. That doesn't describe it. It was, well, the closest I can come to it is a relaxation. Not a letting down, but more a kind of straightening out without tension, if that means anything. I don't know. The therapist says, it sounds as though this wasn't a new idea, but it was a new experience of really feeling that I did care, and if I get the rest of that, a sort of a willingness on your part to let me care. And about nine interviews later, she refers to that experience again, talking about it as perhaps the most of the therapy for her. She describes it in this way. 
the realization at a certain point that a kind of diathermy had been set up, something that could be measured if it could be. I mean just that, a kind of radiant warmth which stores. Statements of that sort have had meaning for me describing the client's experience of the relationship, of which otherwise I can see only my side of it. Thus, for me, warmth and liking, permission to be completely free and at the same time completely safe, with safety and freedom, exist in a of empathic understanding. These are the words and phrases that describe my attitude in the at the times when therapy really seems to be taking place. Now I'd like to talk about the process in the client in terms of the way that I've experienced it. I feel that the element which keeps and which keeps making me reformulate my ideas about therapy is the experience of a taking place in the relationship in which both of us are involved but in which the movement is primarily in the client. You can call it growth or you can call it therapy. To me, I think they're synonymous. There's a compellingly dynamic quality to it such that when you experience it happening in another, you'd like to be able to facilitate it more adequately, more frequently, my own description of this experience keeps changing as rapidly as my descriptions of the therapeutic relationship. Here again is a current formulation. First, I want to talk about exploration. In my experience, a relationship of the nature I have described tends to lead to certain types of activity on the part of the client. In the first place, it leads to exploration, the roaming into a variety of areas with the kind of feeling that the client mentioned above. Why am I doing this? Why am I going about it in this vague way? But with the realization there that she would do it that way, or she wouldn't be using her freedom in that fashion. The same client gives an of this exploring experience which she describes as being like handling the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. She says, You know, I keep having the thought occur to me that this whole process for me is kind of like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. It seems to me I am in the process now of examining the individual pieces don't have too much meaning. Probably handling them, not even beginning to think of a pattern, that keeps coming to me. And it's interesting to me because I really don't like jigsaw puzzles. They've always irritated me. I pick up little pieces, and here she gestures to illustrate her statement, with absolutely no meaning except the feeling that you get from simply handling them pattern, but just from the touch, I probably feel, well, it's going to fit someplace here. The therapist says, so at the moment, that's the process, just getting the feel, the shape, and the configuration of the different, with a little bit of background feel of, yeah, they'll probably fit somewhere, but most of the attention is focused right on and what is its texture? She says, that's right. There's almost something physical in it. And the therapist says, you can't quite describe it without using your hands, can you? Almost, almost a sensuous sense in it. She says, that's right. Again, it's the feeling objective, and yet I've never been quite so close to myself. Well, perhaps that gives sense of this aspect of exploring, 
this exploration without knowing for sure what's being explored or why it's being explored. Then a second aspect I'd like to talk about is experiencing. This other element that has come to have a great deal of meaning for me is that the client seems to experience feelings in a very peculiar way. This is something which I think is quite difficult to get across in any meaningful fashion. In our daily lives, there are a thousand and one reasons for not letting ourselves experience our attitudes fully. Reasons from our past and from the present reside within the social situation. It seems too dangerous, too potentially damaging to experience them freely and fully. But in the safety and freedom of the therapeutic relationship, they can be experienced fully, clear to the limit of what they are. They can be and are experienced, as I say, in this fashion that I like to think of as a pure culture. At the moment, the person is his fear, or he is his anger, or he is his tenderness, or whatever. Perhaps, again, I can indicate that somewhat better by giving an example from this same client that will convey something of what I mean. This comes from a 31st interview with this woman. She had talked several times of a recurrent feeling which she can't quite pin down and define. Is it a feeling that grew up because she had practically no relationship with her parents? Is it she's responsible for all the elements of her life? Is it a guilty feeling? She really isn't quite sure, and she ends that kind of talk with this statement. I have the feeling that it isn't guilt, and she quietly weeps for a while. And then she says, of course, I can't verbalize it yet. It's just being terribly hurt. The therapist says, so it isn't guilt, except in the sense of being very much wounded somehow. She continues to cry and says, You know, often I've been guilty of it myself, but in later years when I've heard parents say to their children, Stop crying, I've had a feeling as though, Why should they tell them to stop crying? They feel sorry for themselves. And who can feel more adequate than a child? Well, that's sort of what I mean. As though I thought they should let him cry and feel sorry for him too, maybe, in a rather objective kind of way. Well, that's something of the kind of thing I've... I mean now, just right now. The therapist says, I guess that catches a little more of the flavor of the feeling, that it's all really weeping for yourself. And she says, and then, of course, I have come to see and to feel that over this, I have covered it up. She cries again for a time. Then says, I have covered it up with things, which in turn I had to cover up. That's what I want to get rid of. I almost don't care if I hurt. The therapist says, on the basis of it, as you experience it, is a feeling of real tears for yourself. But that you can't show, you mustn't show. So that's been covered by bitterness, which you don't like, and that you'd like to be rid of. You almost feel you'd rather to hurt than to feel the bitterness. And what you seem to be saying quite strongly is, I do hurt, and I've tried to cover it up. She says, I didn't know it, the therapist says, it's like a new discovery, really. She says, I never really did know. You know, it's almost a physical thing, sort of as though I were looking within myself at all kinds of nerve endings and bits of things that have been sort of mashed. The therapist says, as though some of the most delicate aspects, physically almost, have been crushed or hurt. 
she says, yes. And you know, I do get the feeling, oh, you poor thing. The therapist says, you just can't help but feel sorry for the person that is you. I hope that perhaps this excerpt conveys something I've been talking about. The experiencing of a feeling all the way to the limit. She was feeling herself as though she were nothing but hurt at that moment. And though I'm not sure this can be conveyed, type of moment, and I know it occurred in that particular instance, that I feel as though I am understanding at a sufficient depth and with sufficient freedom within my that there is this kind of unity of experiencing between us, which, as I say, I think is characteristic of the deepest elements in therapy. I used to think that when feelings such as this were expressed in that once they were out in the open, they had to be dealt with by the client. I believe it is much more true of my present experience to recognize that when they are experienced in this deep and complete, all-out kind of fashion, they are dealt with at that moment. There is nothing more needed. I've come to believe for myself has throughout therapy experienced in this fashion all the emotions which organismically arise in him and has experienced them in this kind of no then he has experienced himself in all the richness that he has within himself and that at that point therapy is complete when the individual has experienced with a sense of safety all of the wide range of emotions within himself, then he's ready to experience them in the future without denial or distortion and to handle them. Perhaps another excerpt will illustrate what I mean by this deep experiencing of feeling. It's of the same type as the last one, though the feeling is quite different. In the initial she refers to some card sorting that she's doing. I shall have to explain that, otherwise you wouldn't understand the reference. This client was the subject of one of our and at intervals during therapy, we would use the cue technique. She had to sort a number of cards, and when she speaks of placing one of the cards, it means she picked one of the cards as being most characteristic of herself. This is sufficient to explain this remark, and I won't go on to try to explain the key technique. This is from the 33rd interview. She says, One thing worries me, a feeling that occasionally I can't turn out or turn away, a feeling of being quite pleased with myself. Again, this, this cue technique. I walked out of here one time and... Cards. Impulsively, I threw my first card. I am an attractive personality. I looked at it sort of aghast, but I left it there. I mean, because, honestly, I mean, that's exactly how I felt. Well, that bothered me, and I catch that now. Every once in a while, I get a sort of pleased feeling. Nothing superior. I don't know, sort of pleased. And it bothered me. And yet I wonder. I rarely remember things I say here. I wondered why it was that something about what I've felt about being hurt that I suspected in my feeling when I would hear someone say to a child, don't cry. I mean, I always felt that it isn't right. I mean, if he's hurt, let him well, then, now this pleased feeling that I have. I've recently come to feel that there's something almost the same thing. We don't object when children themselves. I mean, there really isn't anything vain. Maybe that's how people should feel. 
The therapist says, You've been inclined almost to look askance at yourself for this feeling. Think about it more. Maybe it comes close to the two sides of the picture. That if the child wants to cry, why shouldn't he cry? And if he wants to feel pleased with himself, does he have a perfect right to feel pleased with himself? And that sort of ties in with what I would see as an appreciation of yourself that you've experienced every now and again. So you're saying, I'm really a pretty rich and... She says, something like that. And then I say to myself, our society pushes us around and we've lost it. And I keep my feelings about children. Well, maybe they're richer than we are. Maybe it's something we've lost in the process of growing up. The therapist says, it could be that they have a wisdom that we've lost. She says, that's right. I think that positive feelings of this kind are for many people much more difficult to experience than are the negative feelings. I think that's true for many of us, certainly for many of my clients. It doesn't take very much to make us feel or to permit into our awareness the lurking many of the feelings in us are very bad, taboo, antisocial, but to really admit to ourselves that we are likable creatures, that we are tender and responsive, that we really have a desire to give affection, that perhaps we could really like ourselves, I think it's that sort of thing which is often very hard for people to admit to themselves. Now another phase of psychotherapy, as I have experienced it, is the easy alteration in ways of behaving. One of the genuinely surprising elements of therapy is that if the relationship is established, and if this exploring occurs, and this experiencing of self, then behavior changes occur almost unnoticed, and they are only realized as the client looks back on his behavior. Behavior changes do not seem to come by struggle to clients. Once the experiences going on within the organism are freely available to awareness, then the person finds himself changing rather than making himself change. And again, I think this is better expressed by my client than I could put it. Talking about her relationship to her daughter, which has been very difficult over quite a period of time, she gives this bit after a long pause during the interview. She says, I think, really, my relationship with Peggy has come along almost in leaps and bounds. It seems awfully good. As a sort of proving point, there's been a feeling, well, let's try to be as easy as possible. Let's know if the shoe pinches. There are times when there's been a certain amount of control on my part, but just last weekend, we just both blew up at each other, and I just let her have it, and she let me have it. And I think it was very fine. I mean, no hangover, no tensions, no nothing. The therapist says, somehow that seems like more proof than you'd had before that the relationship really was better, that you didn't have to hold off from any negative feelings. You could just bring them out, both of you. She says, that's right, and it was a good thing, too. I mean, it was sort of her saying to me, now you, you can't run my life. And me, I in turn said, no, I can't run your life but I certainly can think my own thoughts, too. And I mean, it, it was a good thing, and there was no hangover at all. In fact, it ended with both of us sort of laughing because we'd become so darn dramatic over practically nothing, which was awfully good. I think this is an instance of the kind of behavior change that I mean. Change is not planned, it simply occurs. I'd also like to give one more. 
This was toward the conclusion of our interviews. It is her 45th interview, and she's looking back over a number of things that have gone on, and this is the first time that she mentions this particular aspect with anything like this degree of clarity. She says, I began learning, oh, a lot of other things. One, for instance, rather shocking thing. I just stopped rejecting the feminine role. Well, I just mean quite by magic, which, of course, really I wasn't aware of. How can one do it and be so completely... Well, I might have recognized, yes, there was something wrong, but I never realized the extent of it. The therapist responds, but in some way that you don't understand and don't understand how you could have been blind to it before, you find it isn't so necessary to protest against being a woman. She replies, No, it's just amazing. And of course I couldn't bring it out any place but here, I'm sure. But it is kind of an amazing thing. And there's a difference, believe me, in the way a man lights my cigarette. Now that doesn't seem believable. I'm just a little bit amazed by the whole thing, I'm sort of a little bit shocked by it, I think. Perhaps that gives a bit of a notion of what I mean when I say that behavior changes just occur and then are realized rather than struggled for and achieved. The exploring and experiencing that I've tried to describe results in these changes which just happen and are then observed. I think perhaps I've said enough to raise some questions which we can discuss. I've tried to describe the way that I have experienced the meaning of counseling and psychotherapy. The deep, subjective relationship characterized by respect and empathic understanding. The exploring process that goes on in the client, getting in touch with hidden feelings the full and deep experiencing of these feelings, some having been too shameful to see the light of day, and positive. And finally, the quiet change in behavior which takes place because of this new type of experiencing. In conclusion, I would like to say that for me, to be a part of this fluid, moving process of personality change, is the most exciting thing I know. It seems to be true that when I can give myself freely to this kind of experience, it carries me forward in directions that I don't clearly know toward goals that I can but dimly define. But perhaps to be a part of this unknown, forward-moving process of real relationships between real persons is what life is all about. That concludes Dr. Rogers' lecture. Here now are the remarks which were given by the chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. Rogers. I'm sure the applause shows the deep appreciation of the group, as does the fact that as many people as are here have also been turned away from the auditorium. Dr. Rogers very kindly consented to answer questions. I merely will get the ball rolling, and then I don't think that you should address them to me. I think that if you address them right to Dr. Rogers, it saves a lot of time and is a lot more real. Who would like to raise the first question? Then after that, I am sure there will be a number that will come directly to Dr. Rogers. I hope, Dr. Rogers, that you will repeat the questions so that they can be heard by all. The question is... In the counseling situation, if the person is not particularly verbal or articulate, does that make counseling more difficult? I haven't found that to be true. One thing that I've often realized if I go through a recorded interview or one that has been transcribed and just try to take out of it the different major themes of feeling, there aren't so terribly many. There may be 10, 20, 30 in an interview. A person can be awfully quiet during an interview and still express that many themes of feeling. In other words, the way it seems to me is that some people are 
able to express a feeling and it's all dressed up and put in a large context with many details and so forth and other people just express the feeling with no trimmings I can't see that as far as therapy is concerned it really makes any difference the only difference it might make is for the counselor who may find it terribly hard to wait for a person to express himself the person who can be very verbal fills up all the seconds with talk while he's thinking of what really comes next and then is able to express it and with the second person you may both have to sit and wait for a time before he's ready to express something else. Uh, I had a very interesting experience on that during this semester. I've been counseling a client in front of a group. Well, actually, I've been doing that with two clients. And one of them is a high school boy who is both quite inarticulate and has a speech defect. And during the first interviews with that boy, I was comfortable enough, but I learned after each interview that the group nearly went through contortions. There would be pauses, there would be times when no one was saying anything, and they couldn't stand it. One person said, My hands just grow so moist and full of perspiration, I, I can't, I, I just feel as though somebody has to say something. Well, obviously, an inarticulate person might make counseling more difficult for that counselor but I think they would be mistaken if they thought that it really made counseling, in its basic sense, more difficult. That's my comment on that. That question is, what happens to your identification? How far can you go? Weeping. What happens to you? And then there followed quite a bit of laughter. And I said... You can laugh, but I regard that as a very real question, and I think one of the most difficult questions I know to answer and, and to be sure of the answer. Perhaps it's more easy to say a couple of things that are not true. I think it is not true that the counselor simply remains aloof, cool, saying, so you're weeping. That is certainly not it. On the other hand, I think that we're all equally sure that just to join in the weeping about the same thing is not therapeutic either. I don't know quite what to say. One word that sometimes seems to me to be an accurate expression of my feeling at such a time is, I am moved. I really am emotionally moved by it. And I think oftentimes the empathy runs pretty deep so that you really do realize how it feels to be this person. And, and yet there's a real shade of difference between that and being this person and being overwhelmed by the feeling. And it's... I don't even know if there is a verbal answer to your question. It's one that I think is experienced. You get to the point of feeling a real empathy and certainly a real emotional involvement without its being identification in the sense of I feel just the same way you do. That gentleman said that he understood that my way of working with people was not in any way to direct the person and he noticed in these excerpts that I read that I made various remarks and did that mean that I had changed my point of view or what? Well, sir, I've, I've changed my point of view in many ways, but not on this basic point, I would say, of really feeling that it's up to the person to direct himself. If you... Let, let me describe the way my remarks that I read seem to me. They may seem another way to you, but this is the way they seem to me. I was really trying to get deeply inside the feeling of this person. And it's very easy to be mistaken on that. I mean, my own prejudices, my own attitudes, my own problems from the past may come in and cause me to misunderstand what this person is really feeling. So my responses are basically the attempt to check my understanding with this person. In other words, in effect, I'm saying, now this is the way I get the thing. This is the way I understand your feeling. Is this right? And I guess in the excerpts I read, there are no real instances of my being wrong. 
but it happens plenty of times, where a person says, No, no, that isn't what I meant. I was trying to say this. All right, then, I'm corrected, and put back on the track of the really correct empathic understanding of the feelings that he had. I'd also say that the desire to respect the other person's self-direction is certainly not simply a matter of the words that you say or don't say. It's much more deeply a matter of intent. And I think at times, any of us who are counselors, even when we're trying very hard to give this other person the real opportunity to explore, to experience, and direct his own life, and so on, that we may find at times there creeps in a desire on our part to say, why don't you see this a little more quickly? Or, for goodness sakes, why don't you do this? Or, uh, why don't you move into that area that you seem to be avoiding, and so on? Well, for me, and I certainly do that kind of thing, I find again that if I'm sensitive to the client, I usually get some reaction pretty quickly, which indicates on the client's part the feeling, well, aren't you pushing me? And uh, when I get that reaction, then somehow that helps me to pull back and, and quit it. This person is asking, to what extent do I think my publications have been read and used by people who aren't able to carry individuals all the way through therapy? For example, 45 interviews, as in this case. And in consequence, wouldn't they have been better off to have used a different procedure? Well, for me, I guess that breaks down into two questions. I really don't see it as one. The answer to the first is that if you ever write anything, you will learn to your dismay that what you write can be used in any damn fashion imaginable. And I must confess, I can't hold myself entirely responsible for that. On the other hand, I think I would say this, and, and I mean it quite deeply, that if a person is going to tr try to carry on some sort of counseling and is not very adequately equipped to do it, I guess I would rather have him try this procedure than some more interventive procedure, because I really think the risk of damage is much less. The question is, how do I know how and when to conclude counseling? When does it arrive at a natural conclusion? Well, and there we have good information from the person who is most interested. When the client feels that he's achieved the degree of help that he wishes at this point, then, in my estimation, that's probably the best time to conclude therapy. And when I say probably there, I say it with real feeling because there are times when I don't know. I mean, you see instances where people have gained help from counseling, but you feel from what they've already said that there are many unresolved problems within their personality. If from their point of view they've gained help, if they feel ready to go out on their own saying, goodbye, thank you, I think at the present time I feel that's the best thing to do, to permit them to close on their own volition. It's an arguable point some people feel differently about it. But again, it seems to me that, and I suppose I've thought a lot for myself, partly on a philosophical basis, because with some of these clients, I would quite agree that it would be a great mistake to say that all of their problems have been resolved. Only they now seem to feel, I can go along now in a way that is suitable to me. Well, I see that as somewhat parallel to the kind of thing that we've come to in the medical and, and dental fields. Your dentist or, or your doctor may say, well, you really should have, yes, I know you've had some work done, but you should have some more work done, or you should have this operation. It's still the right of every one of us to decide, yes, I guess I will, or 
No, I think I'll go along without it, thank you. And I guess that I feel that in the psychological realm, too. The question is, briefly, why do I feel that positive feelings are more easily repressed than negative? That's sort of going at it from the other end, and I really never quite thought of it that way. Uh, the way I would be inclined to put it, that seems to check with my experience, is that as therapy goes on, a person brings out various materials that he's been, well, first that he's been unaware of, and then dimly aware of, and then still finds it very difficult to communicate, and so on. Often the very last and seemingly deepest things that are expressed are the positive attitudes that he has toward himself. I don't know that I would really be quite ready to offer a hypothesis as to why that is. I, I expect that I'd better leave that an open question. I don't know. It's simply that that is my experience, that often the positive feelings seem to be the most difficult to communicate. I can think of various, very speculative answers, but I'm sure so can you, and I wouldn't want to give any undue validity to one of those. Do I regard counseling and psychotherapy as the same thing, and if so, what do I recommend or have to say in regard to the situation where you can't see a person over a considerable period of time? The answer to the first part of that is quite simple. Yes, I do see counseling and psychotherapy as the same thing, in the sense that I think all attempts to help people on a face-to-face -face interview basis range along a continuum. It certainly is true that there are some very poor and feeble attempts of that sort, and some very good and deep attempts of that sort. But I hate to say that the poor and feeble ones are counseling and the good ones are psychotherapy. And I'm frank to say, I've never been able to see any real difference. Quite the contrary. My experience has been that if people are... I think of one specific instance, where a group of rather untrained people were appointed in the school system to do counseling. Well, what they did first was oftentimes fairly horrible, to be quite honest. But they were a conscientious group, and they tried to get additional training and they gained more experience and so on. And certainly after a while, some of them were doing psychotherapy. You can call it counseling if you want to, but I don't know why we should really try to find a dividing line. I think that what we're seeking for there is a way of saying that all of us can grow in the depth of helpfulness that we can provide for other people with whom we work. But I would rather see that all as one continuum than chop it in two. Uh, now the question, what about the occasions when you do not have the opportunity of continuing to work with a person but can only see them perhaps for a time or two? That, that always fascinates me, all the implications of it. Because I guess the way I see it from my biased point of view is this. It sounds as though we had some notion that, well, if I've only got an interview or two with you, why, of course I can help you much more drastically in that time. On the other hand, if you've got loads of time, then I'll offer you less help and we'll stretch it out over a long period of time. Now, I feel that's erroneous, and I would at least raise the question for consideration that oftentimes, when people can only see an individual for an interview or two, they try to sew the whole thing up with whatever they regard as sewing it up. Diagnosis and advice or interpretation or a lot of other things. And, and what is accomplished, I think, is a feeling of real closure for the counselor. He feels there. That really is finished. But in terms of the client, I often feel that perhaps we would be much better off to offer that person a helping relationship in which he can to that degree become a little bit more himself. If it's only one interview, it may only be that much. It may not be nearly the help he needs. It may have lots of deficiencies in it. 
Only it just seems to me to be more realistic in his terms than is the notion that in 45 minutes or something we can really accomplish a great deal. So I guess I would say that in my experience at least anything that to me seems helpful over a long period of time with a person seems helpful over a short period too. Not as helpful as it might be, not a hundred percent, not maybe what the person would like, maybe not what I would like, but nevertheless meaningful, I think. The question is, what are some of the implications of your approach for schools and other organizations? Hmm. It, it's been our experience that if a person goes into a school system or into an industry, an elementary school or a high school or whatnot, it pretty soon becomes clear that this way of working with people happens. It really isn't something that you can quiet and the whole school go on operating on a diametrically opposed point of view. Either you become neurotic or something, or the school does. At any rate, it really is true that, and I think I've been forced to realize this in a number of situations, that what we're talking about here is not counseling, which therefore could be done off in a counseling office and never mind how the school runs. It's a way of looking at and, and handling human relationships. And somehow you're dealing in human relationships most of the time you're in a school. So that the experience I think people have had who've gone into a school system and been effective in it has been, first of all, they've been able to try to be accepting and understanding of pupils who come to them or who are sent to them. And when that begins to show some signs of making a difference, then it's a kind of a ferment in the school. Then you get teachers being interested, and, and you get teachers being very critical, because they sense something is going on here which could well be opposed to the whole way I've taught and worked with people all my life. And then it's a question of whether the counselor can be accepting and understanding without this in his or her relationship with the teacher. And, and then it begins to sneak into the way committees are operated and the administration of the school and so forth. In other words, a point of view that discovers an experience that given safety and freedom, people seem to be able to do something about their own internal problems and their own problems in relationships with others just does have for the way a classroom is conducted, or a committee is managed, or a school is run, and so on. And as I say, there, there are times, particularly in school systems, and in universities, and in industries, when the whole philosophy on which the institution is running it, it is one that is quite diametrically opposed to that. And it isn't easy to have two things going in opposite directions within the One reason for, for saying that, quite frankly, is that I've gradually learned and sometimes warned students on this. Don't get too interested in this approach, because it may get you into trouble. I happen to think that it's a kind of trouble, but I wouldn't deny that it can cause organizational difficulty. Any other questions? The question is, does the capacity for self-direction really rest upon the degree of intelligence that the person has? I, I do have a view on that, and yet I think a lot of people, many of you perhaps, will in the long run be in a better position to answer it than I am. I think that within the interview, there's not much question in my mind, intelligence is a relatively unimportant factor. And I think the reason for that is not too far to seek. The highly complex, 
highly intellectual graduate student or psychologist or Ph.D. or whatnot, we have extremely complex problems and very complex defenses against revealing his true feelings. The person who's pretty dull has to contend with much simpler problems, much simpler defenses. I, I really feel that there's a... Mm, that it keeps about parallel in terms of actual resolution of emotional difficulties in the interview. I expect your question lies somewhat beyond that. Does the less intelligent person have the real capacity for self-direction in the total world point of view as well? Well, certainly there are limitations there, but I must say I guess I'm continually impressed with the fact that in regard to the dull and in in regard to all of the deviant or peripheral groups, we are very much inclined to underestimate the degree of their capacity for self-direction. Estimate it. I guess that's as far as I could go because I wouldn't like to make some extreme statement there. The statement was, it sounds as though you have a great deal of confidence. Well, I think that the... Let me let me elaborate on that. From a pretty personal point of view, rather than trying to general as I did a moment ago, my experience has led me to believe that in working with individuals, in working with groups, in working with university classes, in working with staff members, and so on, my hypothesis is that they really can be trusted to be self-directing. That doesn't mean they'll do a beautiful job of it right off the bat or anything. It doesn't mean they won't make mistakes, either in individual therapy or in a group conduct of an administrative enterprise. But if a climate of safety and freedom of the kind I was describing can develop, then I can be quite sure that the direction will basically be sound. Now, it's also been my experience that many organizations and I'm certainly not saying this about any one type because I think it applies to universities elementary schools and industries and lots of other places hold a basic hypothesis which comes very close to being the reverse of that that you cannot be an individual to be self-directing and consequently your first step is to set up all kinds of machines he'll be properly guided by those who know where he should go. And so you get curricula and examination procedures and personnel procedures in industry, foremen and supervisors and the whole hierarchy and machinery of management, guidance, direction, and so on, which, if I may make a side comment, is terribly one of my staff members, since I've been out here, I think it was a New Yorker cartoon. I don't know where they found it. A new employee coming into industry at a desk marked personnel manager. And the personnel man was telling the new employee that you'll find that we have no system here, Mr. Jones, with the result that things get done immediately. I know that could be debated. That rang a bell for me. The question was, aren't numbers the determining factor in that kind of thing? Certainly they're a very important factor. I've sometimes put it this way, that I think we have kind of a test tube solution for individual and group self-direction. Because in dealing with individuals or dealing with quite small groups, I just feel very confident. I don't care what the problem is or what the mix-up is or how deeply involved they are or how, how messy it seems. Okay, I wouldn't be afraid of that at all. I do think that at the present time, if you say, yes, all right now, how do you translate that into dealing with some institution of 500 people? I get 
much more cautious because I don't think we know. I guess one reason for using that term test tube solution is that it seems to me if we do have a procedure which works with small groups and with individuals then probably if we put the amount of energy and concentrated intelligence on that problem that we do now on some of the complex ways of trying to keep people from doing what they're not supposed to do and making sure that they do the things they are supposed to do, we might solve it. But I would quite agree that I don't think it is solved at the present time. We're still working very much on that. Now, are there clients with whom I would prefer not to work? And if so, would I say more about that? I guess not particularly. I, I really can't think of any group of clients. I mean, some sort of classification. Well, sometimes any counselor has personal reactions. I don't take to this person. I don't like this person. And sometimes that persists, and sometimes it doesn't last very long. But, and I would also add to this, I think there's a great deal that we don't know about dealing with deeply disturbed people. As far as that's concerned, there's a lot we don't know about dealing with the mind run of people. We have failures in our counseling, as well as successes, which shows we don't know what might be known. But as far as being able to say, and there is this group of people that probably we should not work with, no, I couldn't honestly say that. That question was, prior to the first interview, what do we do, how much do we go into the case before the beginning of the first interview? Well, at the counseling center, I must say that's a question that can be answered briefly. The receptionist at the desk has to get the name and address and phone number of the client, we also, for some kind of unknown reason, ask, how did you learn of the counseling center? And then an appointment is made with the counselor. Now, uh, let me speak about that a little further, because I suppose that's being facetious. We have a lot of respect for all the diagnostic procedures, the measurement procedures that have been developed. We use them a great deal in the client on whom we're doing some kind of research, when the clients are involved in some kind of research project. We use them in research projects to study hypotheses we're trying to test. But where we're talking, as I presume you were, of the service task, I'm frank to say that the reason we do not use a large amount of information gathering and diagnostic procedures is that we're unable to see that we actually use them in any significant way in therapy. Now, I know some people say they do make use of case history data, diagnostic data, and so on. Some of them really feel that it guides their therapy. Others, and I respect this, others feel that... I've, I've talked to a number of therapists who say but I couldn't feel comfortable in working with a person if I didn't know a lot about him. All right. I'd feel that was a legitimate reason for getting all that data. Only let's do it for that purpose, knowingly, rather than pretending that it has something to do with the therapy. If it's obtained to make the counselor comfortable, that's a legitimate purpose. You've got to have a comfortable counselor in order to have good therapy. But it interests me that, well, uh, just one minor comment, for example. Most people, psychologists or psychiatrists, who go into private practice, drop most of this monkey business about lots of data collecting before they start work, because they're in a spot where they've got to be sure they're producing results, so they go about it in a way that seems to be most effective. But in a large institutional setup, then often... Well, the thing that always makes me despair is that sometimes in some Veterans Administration setups I know, and other places, you may get 20 to 30 hours of professional time invested, sometimes more than that, I'm pretty sure, before anyone begins to think about helping this individual 
And what troubles me is that if those 30 hours were invested in therapy right from the start, sometimes the person would be walking out of the door with the same amount of professional investment that now is involved in getting him to the point where now we have a case discussion on should we take him for therapy. And I don't like it. How have you come to adopt this trial and error approach? Uh, well, I can't feel the last phrase is particularly flattering, um, but I guess it's uh, almost true. I prefer to put it that rather than trial and error, that it developed out of our experience in counseling. But it is true that starting from a quite interpretive, interventive kind of approach, over lots of years of staff discussions and consideration of what was effective, oh yes, and having, having started too with the notion that, I mean, I can quite sympathize with these people who say, there can't be any rational therapy without a thoroughgoing diagnosis first, that's where I came in, because I felt that too. And it's only as you consider, well now, in what we did with this case, what was really helpful? Pretty soon you begin to drop out a lot of the things that initially you thought were helpful. At least that's the way we've arrived at our own way of thinking. I'm sure we've been influenced both in known and unknown ways by psychoanalysis, by Ronkian thinking, by lots of other areas of thought. But I think the most important thing was an attempt to continually analyze our own experience and where it seemed to lead. That concludes the question and answer period. The remarks with which the chairman closed the meeting were, I know there must be hundreds of other questions, but I know that Dr. Rogers must be tired. He's been talking here at least since four o'clock and I don't know what time he started this morning. So I am going to close this meeting with a great deal of appreciation to Dr. Rogers.